Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to the organizing committee for the opportunity to start off um, today's, well, basically the meeting in some ways, and today's session. So I've been tasked with um, basically a two-hour topic in 10 minutes, so bear with me. I'm going to try to, uh, as my colleagues say, to keep it simple um, and just touch on the salient features. So I'm going to try to, uh, in 10 minutes, discuss the pathophysiology mechanisms of dyspnea and COPD. So a recent study from Europe um, in well over uh, 30,000 patients uh, of various gold stages has demonstrated or looked at or identified how pervasive dyspnea is in the context of the, of the primary care setting. So you can see that if we look at the MRC dyspnea scale and we pay particular attention to MRC 3, 4, and 5, which is widely considered to be the state of dyspnea that impacts negatively on, on health-related quality of life and physical activity. You can see that with increasing um, stage of COPD or decreasing FEV1 as a percent predicted, you can see that by the advanced stage of disease, there's about 75% of these individuals that are living with chronic refractory dyspnea, and this is in the primary care setting. So it's, this is a real burden to the, the patient as well as the healthcare provider who is trying to manage this particular symptom um, in these patients. Why is this important? Well, an important study by uh, Nishimura and colleagues from about uh, 12, 15 years ago has looked at the, the cumulative percent survival over a five-year follow-up in patients with, uh, with COPD categorized based on the MRC dyspnea score. And what you can see is that patients with more mild, moderate, severe, and very severe COP, uh, uh, dyspnea based on the MRC rating, you can see that the five-year survival progressively deteriorates as the sensation or the awareness or self-report of dyspnea increases. So again, not only is it highly pervasive, it also seems to be a strong predictor of mortality. And importantly, it's a better predictor of mortality than the often used FEV1. And to show that even further, if we look at, if we look at the five-year association or the longitudinal changes between MRC reports of dyspnea and FEV1, is you can see that there is clearly a discrepancy between the two parameters, where dyspnea rises over time in patients with COPD, while the FEV1 changes relatively little. So again, FEV1 is not necessarily a very good correlate um, of an individual's symptom burden. So with that in mind, we look a little bit into the pathophysiology of COPD. And what I'm going to try to convey to you today is that there are really two basic fundamental mechanisms behind the symptom of dyspnea and COPD. The first is that there's an exaggerated drive to breathe, as I'm demonstrating here. And the second is that there's alterations in static and dynamic breathing mechanics due to expiratory flow limitation and static and dynamic lung hyperinflation. And they combine to provoke the symptom of dyspnea in perhaps uh, variable ways. So here I'm showing you an index of ventilatory efficiency or inefficiency on a, on a, during a cycle exercise test with going from normal and through to increasing gold grades based on post-bronchodilator spirometry. And clearly you can see that with an increasing VEVCO2 intercept during incremental cycle exercise, you can see that in the advanced stages of disease there is severe ventilatory inefficiency. So in other words, there's a very high or elevated drive to breathe. Paradoxically, these individuals, as we know, due to expiratory flow limitation and lung hyperinflation, they really have a limited room to breathe. So there's already a discrepancy between what, they're, what they basically their bodies want them to do and what they're physically capable of doing. And so if we look again, going from normal through to increasing gold grades, and we look at static lung hyperinflation, and we look at lung, um, and, and lung hyperinflation and pulmonary gas trapping, and this is through plethysmographic lung volumes. In the red, I'm showing you residual volume, the expiratory reserve volume, and a parameter that's become very important in the context of understanding dyspnea in COPD and physical activity limitation, which is the inspiratory capacity. And what you can see is that with increasing severity of disease based on the FEV1, you can see that there's a progressive rise in the residual volume as well as the functional residual capacity. So these patients effectively trap gas and they become statically hyperinflated. And there is this progressive erosion or deterioration of the inspiratory capacity. And it's the inspiratory capacity in patients with COPD that really represents the operating limits for tidal volume expansion in the setting of an increased ventilatory demand during exercise. 
So as the inspiratory capacity declines, the capacity to increase tidal volume expansion and support ventilation is deteriorated in the face of an exaggerated ventilatory demand. So this static lung hyperinflation and pulmonary gas trapping is actually compounded or worsened in the setting of exercise. So what I'm showing you here is the relationship between respiratory pressure generation, so an indication of the effort to breathe, and the, the volume derived from, the, from a breath. And so the relationship between pressure and volume of a respiratory system is sigmoid in shape, where we have the upper alinear portion near total lung capacity and the lower alinear portion near residual volume. And we have this linear portion of the curve, um, which represents really the compliance of the respiratory system. And so in healthy subjects, breathing at rest, indicated here in this gray bar, is that here's our end expiratory and end inspiratory lung volumes. Individuals breathe along this linear portion of the pressure volume curve, where the relationship between the pressure or the effort to breathe and the resultant volume effect or tidal volume expansion are relatively matched and harmonious. In the setting of exercise in healthy individuals, young and, and old alike, is that there is a temporary reduction or a transient reduction in the end expiratory lung volume and an increase in the end inspiratory lung volume. And so during exercise, tidal volume expands along this linear portion of this pressure volume curve. And under these circumstances, the relationship basically between the drive to breathe and the simultaneous mechanical response of the respiratory system is well matched. And under these circumstances, people don't perceive much in the way of, of inherently uncomfortable or intense shortness of breath. However, when you contrast this with patients with COPD, is you can see already that their end expiratory lung volume is elevated at rest. They have an elevated total lung capacity. Their residual volume is elevated, and so at rest, they breathe along, again, a relatively linear portion of the pressure volume curve. However, in the setting of increased ventilatory demands during exercise, is that in contrast to health where the end expiratory lung volume decreases, in COPD, the end expiratory lung volume rises, and this has the effect of positioning the tidal volume on the upper A linear reaches of the pressure volume curve where now there's a discociation or a discrepancy between how much effort needs to go into breathing and how much mechanical response is achieved. And so under these circumstances, they have to generate disproportionately large respiratory pressures or contraction of the respiratory muscles to achieve a given tidal volume expansion. And at some point near the limits of, of total lung capacity, when the inspiratory reserve volume erodes or becomes minimal of about 0.5 to 0.7 liters is that people become incredibly short of breath and they tend to stop exercise. And so if you, an interesting way to examine this is, is to look at the consequences of increasing disease severity and see the type of pressures or efforts that are required to support a given ventilation during exercise. So here I'm showing you if you place an esophageal balloon transnasally down into the, into the esophagus and you measure the inspiratory going negative and the expiratory uh, pleural pressures or the esophageal pressures as an indication of inspiratory and expiratory work, you can see that in healthy subjects with increasing ventilation during exercise, tidal volume will expand or be supported by progressive recruitment of the inspiratory and expiratory muscles. Now, in patients with mild COPD or relatively preserved airflow uh, limit, uh, spirometry, you can see that they're already generating greater negative um, inspiratory pressures for any given ventilation. And this just becomes progressively worse and worse with increasing disease severity. And so you can appreciate that somebody with very advanced COPD, not only do they only achieve ventilations on the order of two to three times above their resting values, you can see that the expiratory and inspiratory pressures or the efforts needed to, to drive this relatively modest increase in ventilation are so dramatically high. And this is occurring in the setting of an impaired mechanical response. So you can already begin to appreciate that there's a discrepancy between basically what the ner central nervous system wants ventilation to be and what the body is able to achieve mechanically. And, and Paralleling this, if you do some unique measurements where you insert a, a, an esophageal catheter, and again with some electrodes, and you evaluate the electromyogram of the crural diaphragm, so you basically just like a peripheral muscle, you can look at the electrical activation of the diaphragm. 
And so here in health, you can see that with increasing neural activation of the crural part of the diaphragm, the major muscle of inspiration, with increasing ventilation, you can see that the, the neural activation of the muscle translates into a relatively normal amount of ventilation. However, as you increase into mild and moderate and, and severe and very severe disease, you can appreciate that even to support just 30 liters a minute of ventilation, patients with very severe disease need to recruit or activate their inspiratory muscles almost maximally just to support very modest elevations in ventilation. And so you can appreciate that when you exercise and you become very tired, for example, this is almost what they're happening to the respiratory muscles. They're very overburdened. They're driven very, very hard to support very modest increases in ventilation. And this could even be ventilation such as walking up one flight of stairs or you know, in, uh, moving from the basement to uh, the first level of a home. So these are not, uh, these are not uh, trivial or, or not meaningful. And so if we look then at the relationship between breathing mechanics and shortness of breath, we can look here, I'm showing you the relationship, everything plotted against ventilation except down here, this is the tidal volume expressed as a percentage of inspiratory capacity. Looking at patients with mild, moderate, severe, and very severe COPD based on post bronchodilator spirometry. And you can see that um, if we just really compare the red and the purple, which is the more mild to the very severe COPD, is you can see that individuals with relatively preserved inspiratory capacity do decline in their inspiratory capacity. They can achieve much higher ventilations at peak than those with more severe disease. Interestingly, you can see that the tidal volume expresses a percentage of inspiratory capacity, which is really an indication of how mechanically limited the tidal volume is. You can see that it expands very quickly to reach a mechanical limit of about 70 to 80 percent of the available inspiratory capacity at very low levels of ventilation. And perhaps not surprisingly, you can see that these patients with very severe or advanced disease become incredibly dyspneic, reaching levels of very severe dyspnea at levels of ventilation just about 30 liters a minute. Interestingly, the relationship between increasing dyspnea intensity ratings and increasing tidal volume to inspiratory capacity appear to be relatively well preserved across the spectrum of COPD severity. Again, indicating or demonstrating the importance of the respiratory mechanical abnormalities to the symptom of dyspnea. The higher your tidal volume to inspiratory capacity ratio is at any given ventilation, the more short of breath you're gonna be. So to try to tie all this together, and set the stage for, my, uh, for the other faculty presenting here today. The basic neurophysiological construct that's been established on many years of, of, of research now looks something like this. You basically have the mechanical response of the respiratory system, which is conveyed to the central nervous system through sensory afferents in the muscles, lungs, and the airways. And we know that in COPD, there is an impaired respiratory mechanical or muscular response to exercise due to um, expiratory flow limitation as well as static and dynamic lung hyperinflation. We also know that there is an exaggerated increase in the central respiratory drive, and I've provided evidence of that, both in terms of the pressure generation as well as the electrical activation of the inspiratory muscles. And so this discrepancy, we believe, is, is something that's able to be consciously perceived as the symptom of dyspnea and what has been termed as neuromechanical dissociation or uncoupling. And in this, in this particular setting of neuromechanical dissociation, we believe that there's this signal to the sensory areas of the brain called central corollary discharge, which allows an individual to consciously perceive the descending motor drive. There is, in some cases, severe limbic and paralimbic system activation, so the activation of the fight or flight response, which might provoke or be responsible for that inherent unpleasantness sensation that many patients um, with COPD complain of, particularly with advanced disease. And of course, it manifests as the symptom of dyspnea, which, as we know, is a, is a symptom that is often experienced quite early, and it leads to physical activity limitation and avoidance, which is, is one of the worst things that can happen in these patients. Thank you.